All right. Good afternoon, virtual history puffs, and welcome back. We're joined by Aiden. Now, Aiden, what goes together better than a good cigar and intelligent conversation? That would be a church bill. For those who don't know, a Churchill is an actual cigar size, and I feel like a sacrilege because I'm actually not smoking a Churchill. I'm smoking, um, this is like a Toro size, but it's a really good one. This is an El Rico Habano, um, natural, just like chocolatey. It's actually flavored a little bit on the tip, but it's not overpowering like acid. What are you smoking today? Well, I am also not smoking a Churchill because I don't have any more in my humidor. So Look at us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? We're so professional, but um, no, but th this is a uh, Arturo Fuente um, Gran Reserva. Oh. Um, it's, it is a Figurado. Yeah, is that what you were smoking the other day? Very well, but uh, I, I actually had one yesterday, but I haven't. Hmm. Did you get I a box of those? Lot. No. Okay. No, I didn't. Although I'm starting to think about it because they are very good. They're not expensive. No, like I was looking online at the second one. Arturo Fuente is like, I think, six dollars for a really good cigar mm -hmm. that's what this is it's about six six ten i think six dollars ten cents it's quality yeah it is the very draw good is really so. tight on this guy so i'm trying to open him up by the way viewers um mm -hmm. if you're really if you have a really tight draw and you don't have a cigar poker one thing that you can do is just very very gently just you know try to open up the shoots inside the cigar by pressing on it like this hmm. It's going to be a tight draw, but that just means it'll last longer. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> so I want to start off by talking about Churchill's cigar habits. All right. He didn't get a cigar like named after him or a cigar size named after him for nothing. I mean, this guy, what did he smoke like 20 cigars a day? In? Oh, it was something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was almost literally constantly smoking. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So. Was that something that people just did back in the day? I don't know that it was something everybody did, but mm. cigars were certainly very popular, especially among the uh, to get this upper, upper class of society, if you will. But yeah, which so, Churchill was the member of. So, yeah, you know, you know what he said? Um, he said cigars are to be smoked in between all meals and if necessary, during meals. That's correct. That's I mean, that's exactly what he was that's doing, too. <laughs> lived I'm actually I've got a bunch of cigar facts about Churchill, so. A couple it's of true. them. So number one, he went on the first um, high altitude flight and it was so high altitude that he had to have an oxygen mask. And he specifically requested that the mask be accommodated to fit his cigars so he could smoke during the flight. Which is stupid because you're getting open flame next to pure oxygen. Like, Yeah, that's a terrible idea, but that is how fire so happens. Care. You know, um, you don't want fire in a high altitude aircraft. Yeah, you, you just, I, I guess it. I Unless guess you it, enjoy bailing out. Yeah. No, I guess they did well. No, Churchill. He was never um, like he was. He's a military man, but he was never like a paratrooper mm -hmm. or you know anything crazy. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that's really unique about Churchill, and I was actually just uh, filming the Napoleon episode. Uh, they had the same trait in that they could remember people's names superbly. Um, like you ever see the movie um was it downfall yeah hmm. yeah but gary oldman uh which by the way phenomenal mm -hmm. film um oh yeah absolutely scene where he's talking to his parliament buddies and he's like yeah i was just talking to like mm -hmm. you know john smith and they're like who who were you talking to but he like named by name the people on the subway that he was talking to um and actually that was it was looking really dark in the parliament about like germany looming over britain and and it looked like they were gonna be taken over or they were gonna lose. yeah and parliament was actually losing faith but it was actually the british people who churchill went out and talked to and they were like yeah no we're not we don't want to give up mm -hmm. weren't there peace talks between britain and germany at that time um to an extent 
yeah. Uh, the really Hitler was kind of banking on the fact that uh, Britain would just surrender anyway. Um, they wouldn't have to negotiate. Um, and so they, they they did talk a few times, but it was it never really amounted to very much. Yeah, because I remember there being some prime minister or general or someone who was like actively either in Germany or in France or somewhere like trying to negotiate a peace between them. And I heard a rumor that Britain even debated um, allying with Germany at the outset of World War II. Was that just like an appeasement thing under Chamberlain? Uh, probably not. It was more accurately just a, a, a meeting to try to end any more violence. Right. Um, and I mean, for the most part, the British agreed with Germany on the threat that the Soviet Union posed. And so it most likely did have something to do with that oh, com really? common enemy, if you will, yes. Yeah, okay. That's interesting, because um, I know that Germany would never have invaded the Soviet Union were it not for Hitler. And now we're going and talking about <laughs> not Churchill, <laughs> but <laughs> well, <laughs> it has a lot to do with it. So actually, I was reading before before I got on the Churchill actually enlisted in the cavalry um, mm -hmm. yeah. at the turn of the 19th century. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He um, he fought in the Boer War. He was. That's what I was about to ask. Is the Boer he was War. all over the he was all over the British Empire. In you know, it's pre World War One state, so peak. Victorian imperialism, if you Victorian will. Victorian imperialism, yeah. Which, which did shape his um, his political mindset going into World War II. So and he was a very aggressive politician, right? He was a very old school imperialism, you know, death before dishonor, the empire uh -huh. must not fall idea kind Britannia of guy. Britannia shall so, never be slaves. Exactly. I mean, I mean, exactly. You know, took those words to heart. I mean, yeah. multiple times over the early 20th century, you know, prior to World War II and even really World War I, there's a big uh, decolonization movement in Britain. Right. And, you know, Churchill was violently opposed to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, were there really decolonization talks? I, that's baffling to me that an empire would consider doing mm -hmm. that. But why it, is that? It, is that because it, of the it, backlash from the native peoples? Yes, it got worse after World War I, um, because, you know, the British sent hundreds of thousands of natives to go fight not a lot of those people came back <laughs> um so that was not a happy moment for those nations involved so i, I mean, know something you know, funny just, so you know you know the sikh soldiers from india yeah their turbans would stick above the trench right because they just had the biggest turbans right and um, <laughs> when they would take off their turbans they would actually just like have bullets falling out of them you know because <laughs> <laughs> get shot um and actually if you notice on indian turbans they have that chakram that metal disc that's actually yep. to stop swords from cutting through uh their you know their head um, makes sense yeah but so so he was in south africa at first and then he goes and, and becomes part of the parliament and actually he was in parliament in world war one a lot of people don't know that yeah. mm -hmm. because he was responsible for finish my sentence Gallipoli. Gallipoli. <laughs> which is not a stupid was... idea you know, no, it wasn't. It was strategically, yeah, it was a good plan. It was just horribly executed, uh, with absolutely zero regard for the actual tactical situation. Oh, so, and and the the I think a lot of it has to do with racism and like social. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because they're yeah. thinking like, oh, these Ottomans, like the Ottoman Empire, they're they're not white, they're Turkish. You know, mm -hmm. we just yeah. we just blitzkrieg through like all the African nations, like it was no problem. And then mm -hmm. they get to Gallipoli, and Mustafa Kemal, known as Ataturk, you know, later on, mm -hmm. he oh, yeah. said, I, I forget the exact quote, but he said, I do not order you to fight. I order you to die. Like, <laughs> these Ottomans were ferociously defending the mm -hmm. peninsula, but also yeah. uh, poor reconnaissance. And I think that has oh, to yeah. Be yeah. Uh, they didn't clear the channel for mines. Yeah. And the first they lost a large gone. amount of their ships to that, yeah. Yeah, got blown up by mines. And then the Ottoman artillery, they drastically underestimated it. Mm -hmm. um, can you imagine Churchill just back in London, like, <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah, 50,000 casualties today on your grand operation. How's your day going? Oh, yeah, no, it's... How's my day going? 
Or how's, how's Churchill's day going? Because yeah, yeah. right. my day is going exponentially better than Churchill's day was yeah. going. It's not hard to have a better day than Churchill, you know, in those no. well, Gallipoli, Almost Gallipoli, every day. Yeah. The whole campaign lasted like a year, I think. But that first, those first couple of days, that was D-Day World War One, like saving Private Ryan mm-hmm. and stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, and also, the thing is, um, again, with poor reconnaissance, they get to the beaches and it's a straight cliff face up mm-hmm. to uh, Cape Helles in, yeah. you know, in the yeah. Turkey. Mm-hmm. Straight cliff face. The Ottomans were yeah. well prepared. Um, yeah, those Anzacs. The Austrian yeah, they, did, they, they, got a hand they, did, they did what they could, but they could not do very much. No, not much at all. So that does not win Churchill any fans. No, and he's already down on fans. Yeah. Because so, people simply don't like him at this point. No, no, not at all. Um, and if the Allies were successful at Gallipoli, that would have ended the war, I'm convinced. It certainly would have knocked Turkey out. Oh, yeah. I mean, they would have opened up that front. Like, Bulgaria mm-hmm. had joined the Central Powers at that point, yeah. and they, they would have had to fight them, but Bulgaria is such a small nation. Like, yeah. You know, plus, with British naval superiority, you know, like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not going to win. There's, yeah, there's, there's not a lot going on. But then he he compensates for you know his horrible blunder by actually going on the front lines himself for the remainder of the mm-hmm. war. Yeah, do you know what he did? Like what what he served as? I I don't know. Mm. I would imagine he was more or less just present near the front line. Um, I, I thought he I, th- I would think that he would join the cavalry because that's what he was in before the war. I don't know. I mean, at this point, he was he was a pretty high-ranking official at this yeah. point, so I don't know that he would have gotten involved in the the meat grinder, as right. it were, Absolutely. directly. Also, like, let's take a minute to appreciate what a funny guy Churchill was. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say some of his quotes. But, oh, um, yeah. What was that one woman he was talking to? I forget her name, but she was like, Mr. Churchill, if you were my wife, I'd poison your tea. And he looks at her and he says... Well, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. Yeah. And uh, I think it was the same woman. Probably He's just picking on this woman. She's like, well, Mr. Churchill, you're drunk. And he goes, yes, and you're ugly, but I'll be sober in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Funny guy. Absolutely. I mean, destroying Absolutely. the opposition here. Yeah. Yeah. In the interwar period, you know, that was like boring for a lot of people. Um mm-hmm. You know, I heard that Churchill had a routine every day where he would, uh, if you watch the movie Downfall, they do this, but um, he would have like bacon and eggs every morning prepared for him. And then he would have mm-hmm. a breakfast cigar and then he would drink like from dawn to dusk. Yeah. <laughs> Just didn't stop. Bacon Look, you, you can't, you can't get hung over if you never stop being drunk. <laughs> if you never stop drinking. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Also, fun fact, Churchill, you ever hear about the Churchill power naps? I, I have heard of those. Yeah. Yeah. So even in the height of the war, mm-hmm. even during the height of the war, Churchill would take a nap every day for like mm-hmm. 20 minutes, you know, even right. in the height of the war. Mm-hmm. And that's funny. Like, you know, me <laughs> in college, even in the, at the height of my you know workload as a mechanical engineer, um, I, st- <laughs> I used to take a nap every day too during, uh, in the mm-hmm. afternoon, uh, yeah. you know, when it didn't have stuff going on. Mm-hmm. So I thought, you know, that was interesting to me. Yeah, I try to nap as much as I can. It's very healthy. It um, is, yeah. <laughs> that's how we defend it. Of course, it's yeah. like, so you can't do it for more than like yeah, you, yeah. an hour, or else you hit REM, and then that's bad for you. Mm-hmm. Right. You feel all groggy when you wake up. Mm-hmm. I always say, like, taking a nap is a, is a great idea as long as you wake up. <laughs> you end up hitting the snap button. That's the kicker. <laughs> I'm talking, yeah. yeah. But, um, Oh, so then we get to World War II, and this is when Churchill really shines, right? So yeah. he, okay, so of course we have appeasement, right? And I don't know what he said about Chamberlain when he was in office, but I think he had some things to say. He was, he was very, very opposed to everything Churchill, or not Churchill, Chamberlain, Chamberlain did from the moment that he started doing things, right? <laughs> so at this point, you have to remember, Churchill is just a member of parliament. He's not... He isn't even, you know, Lord Admiral of the Navy. He's he, he's just a Minister of Parliament. So he was and demoted from the first Lord of the Admiralty in World War One. I. I think he I think he stepped down after World War One. 
Okay. Or he may have been demoted after delivery. I honestly don't know the details there. Well, but he I know that been promoted. <laughs> yeah. So he, he was a member of parliament. Um, and during the 20s, he was responsible for a lot of um, economic policies that were not favorites of the British people. So, okay. for example, he returned the pound to its pre war value. Okay. Uh, pre World War One value, which ended up causing massive inflation, which did not help with the, re which didn't get any better when the Great Depression hit. So, yeah. a lot of people blamed him for how bad it actually got. Was um, that his fault or was that the Depression's fault? It, I mean, it was both because he enacted that policy um, and then the Depression happened. And so people are like, well, this wouldn't have been as bad if Churchill had done that, you know, so. Right. Okay. I guess it, it sort of helped, but the Depression didn't help anybody, especially mm -hmm. Germany. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then we get to appeasement. All right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I bet he is just. Yeah. Famous. Yeah. He opposed everything Hitler was doing. How, was, how many people were in favor of appeasement? Was it just Chamberlain? It couldn't have been. I, it was the majority. The majority of the British people were completely fine with um, appeasement because they weren't worried about Europe. They were worried about the rest of the empire and the situation there because an economic crisis plus a bunch of colonies that really want to break free is a problem. So okay. Brit Britain's attention was turned elsewhere. Right. Um, so, and that's probably part of the reason why you see this sort of attitude coming out of um, the appeasement policies, you know, the phrase peace for our time, you know, after the uh, Munich agreement, that's, that is in and of itself, that represents sort of the, the British philosophy at the time that this is, this is so beneath us and this is so not worth our time mm -hmm. that we're just going to go in, make one change. And then everything's fixed and we're going to go back to our own problems. And this entire time, Churchill is sitting there going, no, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know? um, going over tables and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He completely opposed Nazi rearmament, um, their aggression, all of it. He's like, nope, this is a bad idea. Although he didn't actually consider Hitler to be the main threat. He was still, no, he was worried more about Bolshevism. Communist, okay. Soviet communism than Hitler. Like you were saying, uh, they opposed the Russians, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you have to remember, too, that Churchill is an aristocrat and he was born and raised in the late 1800s. Right. You know, 1874 was his birthday and he's serving at the peak of British imperialism. That is the exact time where communism is the worst possible thing you can imagine as right. an aristocrat. Giving freedom so, to all the, the colonized people, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. So he's very much against communism. So he wasn't really worried too much about Hitler, but he did know that Hitler would be a, a problem if left unchecked. So thus the opposition to appeasement. Right, right. Um, do you think... So did Britain have a lot of trouble holding on to their colonies after World War One? Is that was that like their primary concern? Yeah, absolutely. They were, you know, like I said, there was this huge decolonization movement. Yeah, that was hmm. a very pervasive issue. And right. it was part of the reason Churchill was unpopular is because he opposed it. He was anti decolonization, right? Decolonization, excuse me. <laughs> so he was, and, yeah. you know, poor people didn't like that. Yeah. Right. Um, well, that's my thing is when it came to World War One, Britain pretty much entered that on a whim. They were like, oh, going through Belgium, send over the BEF, you know, like, yeah, right. But World War Two, it took them a, like a, took a lot of effort for them to get involved in that. It wasn't until they were getting attacked that they even considered joining. And then when yeah. it, this is an unpopular opinion. I'm not going to, you know, win any British fans by saying this, but they really <laughs> they really like kind of half-assed world war ii like they didn't send a whole absolutely lot of yeah absolutely <laughs> and you know it's it's really funny when you think about how britain was the one of the allies so you know france um france and britain britain was the one who was like well i guess we're just gonna have to go fix this problem again yeah when hitler invaded poland and um you remember at the time the british army that was actually in Europe and capable of doing anything was only, you know, a couple hundred thousand men. Right. 
And while the French had, you know, five, six million men, yeah, they were the ones who would actually be fighting. And the French were not as gung ho as Britain to get involved because they're like, hey, Britain, yeah. What's Germany's strength? Oh, their army? Okay, what do you need for an army? Land? Hey, look where Germany is, and look where you are. <laughs> You're across the channel. We have to fight these guys. And Burns yeah. like, yeah, so? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Suck it up, yeah. So do you and, think that the reason why they let Germany rearm is because they were so concerned with everything else? Because, like, let's be honest here. They knew exactly what was going on in Germany. Oh, Everybody yeah, absolutely. Knew. It's very obvious. They, yeah, no, they absolutely. Do you were. think it's because they were so concerned with like India and Africa and all that in yeah. the interwar oh, yeah. period? If you know, if you think about what India and Africa is for the British Empire, that's your economy, that's your food oh, yeah. supply, They're so that's small. your manpower. That's you yeah. know, that, if you don't have those, then you're an island off the coast of France right. with pretty much nothing going for you. Can't sustain you. yourself. So, yeah, right. Not, yeah, not you don't have you don't have any oil anymore. You you can't run your fleet. You know. So, what? And we can argue about like whether or not colonization is moral or whatever, but from that point of view, it's very necessary, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why Churchill yeah. wanted it. But yeah, the morality, I think, you know, and, you know, honestly, as far as the morality goes, I feel like that played a big part into how brutal the British sometimes got was because yeah. they needed this. Like, they couldn't afford to lose it easily. Yeah. You know, they're not going to be like, oh, we're sorry, we'll leave. Like, no, no. they're going to stay. They're going yeah. to defend it. I'm, you know, it's. I know. It's all and, they could do. Again, they 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 were very brutal about it. Like they actually invented concentration camps before the Germans right. did in South Africa. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. that, again, that is not up for debate. They were brutal about it, but yeah, uh, we're not here to argue about the morality of colonialism. We're just trying to right. understand it from their from their point of view, whether or not it be flawed. But um, so then so everyone knows what Germany's doing, and. Mm-hmm. You know, Churchill's like the aggressive politician, of course, but he, yep. but he's not really concerned with Germany. He's concerned with, like you said, Russia and, and the colonies. Mm-hmm. So the war does right. happen, right? Yeah. So when does Chamberlain get booted and when does Churchill get on? So that that happens, if you remember, that Germany invades Poland and then you have the phony war, the sitting war. Zitzkrieg. The Polish-German and, war. Right. right. Not yeah. World War II. It's the Polish-German <laughs> war of 1939. Yep. And, then the and so you've got this period where both sides are sitting there going well is, is this really happening right now like what's going on yeah and then germany invades denmark and norway right to secure their um access to the uh you know their channels, yeah, port the ports. cities the channels all that stuff so well what happens to the british are the ones who react to this the british send their fleet to go defend the coast of norway because the germans were invading navally all up the coast all the way up to the north um and the german the german fleet they took heavy casualties but they destroyed the british they absolutely you know they won they occupied really they beat britain and at in like on on the sea in in like a naval game wow that's yeah they sacrificed they sacrificed most of their fleet to do that but they did end up winning and so that's a huge blow to britain and and absolutely to chamberlain's position because at this point, Britain's like, okay, we're in this now. You know, yeah. this is a war now, and you, Mr. Chamberlain, are failing horribly um, yeah. at this at this job. At this point, you know, when the war starts in 1939, Churchill is once again Lord of the Admiralty again, right. um, and the king appoints him as Chancellor to replace Chamberlain because everyone's like, Chamberlain, you screwed this one up big time. Get out of here. <laughs> And they're like, look, we don't like you, Churchill, but you're probably the only person who has been as outspoken about this as anybody. You know, you're the one who said this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Chamberlain's an idiot. You know, well, here you go. Here's your chance yeah. now. Prove it to us, right? <laughs> that's funny. That That's a really, like, selfless decision there. It's like, we, we don't like you, but we know you're what we need right now. So let's, <laughs> you know. That's exactly it. And, you know, it gets even stronger because – Right after the war ends, I mean, almost literally right after the war ends, he's out. Churchill's out again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's back to being unpopular, and everyone's like, "Nope, you're done. Yep, we're not doing no. that again." But also, here's a fun fact: so Oliver Cromwell is a pretty polarizing figure in British history, right? Mm-hmm. And we can talk about the Glorious Revolution later. But um, right. a lot of people are pro and anti Cromwell today. Um, Churchill was a very adamant pro Cromwell person. He really liked what Cromwell did in the Glorious Revolution. That so, makes sense. I don't know what that says about Churchill, but uh, yeah. 
it probably just reinforces everything we've already been saying. You know, he's mm-hmm. this old fashioned, ultra conservative Britain before everybody else type. <laughs> Britain type first. Guys. Yeah, Britain first. So, I mean, that's that is literally what he was like. So, oh, yeah. So then there's there's something that I actually didn't know about until recently, um, mm-hmm. and that's the siege of Calais. So, you know about Dunkirk, right? I mean, everyone knows about Dunkirk. The, the movie right. came out, you know, uh, mm-hmm. four years ago or whatever. But th- that was only possible because there was a garrison in Calais. And Churchill, mm-hmm. this was a really hard decision for him to make, but he had to order yeah. those men to fight to the death so they yeah. could delay the Germans so that the mm-hmm. British could evacuate. And I had never known that they did that. That's like 300-level yeah. stuff right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a couple port cities along that coast from Calais to Dunkirk. And when the German army cut across um, Belgian, the Belgian border from yeah. Germany to the Channel, they swung north and started chopping off those ports so that nobody could escape from that pocket. Yeah, and they got slowed down enough that they didn't hit Dunkirk in time, which right. is you know its own. Like we, we could discuss the decision for them to stop for yeah. an hour and a half. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so that's its own thing in and of itself, but. Calais was all those port cities. They were defended. They were yeah. Pretty much I, I had never known that Calais. I never know that happened. You know, but um, that was that's a pretty heroic and like significant thing that Churchill ordered. And I mean, yeah, uh, he was right to do it because at the mm-hmm. time it was unpopular. Like you know, you're going to order these men to die, but think about how many more would have died mm-hmm. had they yeah, not held on Calais. Yeah, if you don't get those guys out of Dunkirk, you're not staying in the war. Like it's that's just the simple fact of it. You would yeah. be open to invasion. You're not. You're right, going absolutely. to discuss terms. You're going to discuss terms. And Hitler would have been very lenient on the British because he didn't even think the British would fight in the first place. Right. And Hitler actually had a, a bit of like a grudging respect for Britain. Like he, you know, he didn't hate them <laughs> at all. No. So he, he would have been very lenient. And I mean, you see that with France, he was lenient with France. He actually let them have a provisional government set up, yeah. you know, Vichy France, unlike in the East, the Slavic nations. He was like, no, we are totally yeah, no. ethnic now. war. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So I, I, he was actually respectful of the French too, because yeah. um, they actually had a lot of World War I monuments that they didn't destroy when they were steamrolling through the French countryside or cities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you said they established that the Vichy government, the provisional mm-hmm. government, too. Right. Um, so then when it came to the battle for Britain, right, mm. what a dark time. Like, at the time, it's oh, yeah. like Germany's going to win. Right yeah, now. you have a massive disparity in numbers, you know, technology, everything. Yeah. It's not, we know now good. that it was an impossible task mm-hmm. because German pilots only got, like, 20 minutes of flight time over England. Yeah. Mm-hmm. you know yep um but i mean they couldn't really invade by sea right mm-hmm. and so germany's or england's getting bombed and churchill's the prime minister and usually when you're a uh, official like a president or a figurehead during a dark time usually you mm-hmm. become very unpopular but actually churchill got more popular because right. he gave his uh we will fight on the beaches speech at this time mm-hmm. you know yep and like I said, he would go out to subway cars and parks and stuff like that. And he would talk to people and mm-hmm. he would ask them, like, what, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to surrender? And they're like, no, no, we're never going to surrender. So he would go back to parliament and parliament was very in the surrender camp. Most of them mm-hmm. were actually. But yeah, it was Churchill who kept them fighting. And because of that, um, mm-hmm. you know, the war, the war went the way it did. But otherwise, if England would have surrendered, I mean. <laughs> yeah, it would have been very different. Right. Hmm. Very different. <laughs> yeah. So then later, I mean, after that, England kind of took a back seat until 1944. You know, that, that's. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Honest, yeah. 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 They went into North Africa and just fought the Italians until the end of it. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Montgomery in, in mm-hmm. Italy. But that that's like a small, small operation. I mean, I think it's like this, like they did their time in World War One. Mm-hmm. A lot of bravery, a lot of sacrifice. Yeah. And then they're like, yeah, we did that one. Let's just let's let the Americans do this one. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like, look, we'll hold them off. Now you get over here and do something about it, please. So, yeah. Um, 
So then, yeah, but then, you know, you have 1944 when England gets back in. And then because um, Churchill and Roosevelt had such a good relation with each other, that's why you have conferences like Yalta and Potsdam. And actually, one thing that um, they used to do is Churchill used to go over to America. They would take trips mm -hmm. to America. And the way they did foreign policy back then is they would meet up in the White House and they used to get shit faced, you know, yep. uh -huh. <laughs> and they would yeah, like absolutely they would smoke and they would they would just just drink and just get mad <laughs> together. And yeah. Eleanor Roosevelt was, just, was so mad about that. She didn't like that at all. But I mean, because of that. They had great relations with America. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's really the way that foreign policy is and should be, is like figureheads meeting oh, with yeah. each other, <laughs> drinking. <laughs> you know? I mean, hey, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> they won World War II, so. So what do you think? I guess they allied with Russia out of necessity, but not because they wanted to. Exactly. They were not going to make an alliance with Stalin um, anytime soon. Yeah. Um, and then Hitler went and invaded the Soviet Union, and even then they weren't really, they were like, well, should we just let them beat each other up for a while, you know, and win-win at the end of the day, either the Nazis die or the Soviets die, that's, they didn't see a problem with either of those things, right, right. so, you know, it's that quote, sleeping with the devil, uh, talking with, with Stalin, you know, it's just, they didn't, Churchill especially did not like him. No. Um, I mean, it's the same thing with Germany and the Japanese. Like, they didn't like each other, but they, they were yeah. allies out of necessity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have great relations. He established great relations with the U.S., um, mm -hmm. established okay relations with Stalin, like, you know, at those conferences. Yeah. I don't think – do you think they spoke to each other directly? I don't think Stalin spoke English. He probably could speak a little bit. I mean, you know, they've – I think there are some video clips of them chatting, but yeah. – well, fun fact I learned about Stalin the other day. So when he was a general in the Red Army in 1918 mm -hmm. or 1919, um, he took over the city Zaritsyn, which was very mm -hmm. um, significant for their efforts. And then they renamed it Stalingrad. Right. right. So yeah. that's Stalingrad. And now it's called mm -hmm. uh, Volgograd. Yeah. You know, because yeah, it's, it's right off, right on the Volga. Yeah. Stalinization. Yeah. Um, pretty much after that, I think, I think that's pretty much when Churchill gets out of power. And then I think he just. Right. Yeah. He, he sort doing. of, he sort of fizzled out of, out of relevancy. He stayed in government for a while. Um, like he stayed in parliament. He did try to run, run again for, you know, prime minister. I don't recall exactly when that was, but it was in the fifties, I think yeah. and he, he lost. So he, he just kind of. Or, well, he might have won and then been shortly after removed. Well, you think about, like, President Bush, right? He mm -hmm. became super popular because at that time the war in Afghanistan was popular, right? And Churchill did so well with World War II that he would have been popular amongst the people, right? He kept them yeah. without mm – -hmm. he stopped them from surrendering to the, Brit or the Germans, which they would have done. So you would think that he would be popular among the people, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. So it's interesting that he lost power so quickly after the war. Yeah, I think it's it mostly just comes down to his old style. You know, he was a 19th century politician. Yeah. And that was over now. Um, that was gone. And especially after World War II, the decolonization ramps up. Right. And he still opposed that. So he would have become exponentially less popular. And is that um, is that because Churchill lost power and so they immediately started the decolonization process? I wouldn't say that they started it because Churchill was out. It was more that it was just a force of society and it was coming. Um, do you think it was because they, they lost really a lot of? Not. Yeah. Do you think it's because they lost a lot of their military power that they had to give up these colonies in like India and Africa after World War II? It it is possible. Yeah, because I mean, with the the, to the 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 sort of total war that you get developing on World War II, really probably helped a lot of these former colonies start to build up an economy that they could actually survive off of. Um, because, you know, prior to the world wars, a colony's economy was based entirely on exported goods that could be used to manufacture products in Britain. And if you're an independent nation, that just doesn't work because you're not producing things like food, you're producing tobacco or you're producing gold or you're producing steel but you're not making things that your population needs to survive needs right that stuff's being imported 
to sustain your economy while the well, your economy is 100% specialized. Cash but after World War II, right, yeah. yeah. And after after World War II, that shifts a little bit because they needed more factories to produce war goods. So they're producing that in these colonies. So those colonies probably started to gain a higher degree oh, of, of a feeling of, of independence. They started to feel more like they could survive. Um, and I mean, obviously you can see now in the post-decolonization era, a lot of that is just not true. A lot of these countries are still too specialized, and as a result, right. their GDP is garbage. Yeah, they, they just can't grow as a nation. Right, but that probably did play a big part to the decolonization, and so yeah. it also was an ideological thing. You know, Britain's fighting for freedom for freedom of all yeah. peoples against totalitarianism now you kind of have to kind of start being a little more lenient what's so. funny is um britain seems to be really forward with um progressive ideas like that because abolition started in in britain before it started in america yeah. right and then so did decolonization i think they were the first nation to decolonize they were the uh, willing to start that is. right yeah <laughs> the french fought for it but the yeah. british sort of just started to ease off yeah okay um as we wrap up here how's the mid stick on that guy oh it's good it's good it mellows out yeah. a little bit this is this one has some really nice smooth notes it's um I, if i recall correctly it is an ecuadorian hmm. filler and then Ecuador. there's a cameroon yeah cameroon yeah. wrapper and uh it's it's good it's very subtle notes yeah of wood this is leather chocolate Oh really? And it's got a little spice on it too. Yeah. So this is like um, a Connecticut broadleaf, but it's got Nicaraguan fillers. Um, okay. And it's actually flavored, so it, it's very like chocolatey, like really chocolatey. Um, uh -huh. It's like it's the sweetest Maduro that I've ever smoked. You know, <laughs> very good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Churchill, what a guy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the one one last thing I'll say about Churchill is actually everyone back in the 40s, everyone had branding down to a science. Like, look at mm -hmm. the figureheads of all the countries. They knew their brand. You know, Churchill oh, yeah. was the guy with the top hat and the cigar. Mm -hmm. You know, Hitler, I mean, the, the mustache, right? Yeah. You know, you've got style. Like, everyone had branding down to a science back then. Mm -hmm. They all had, as they say, drip. <laughs> they all... Drip. They all really filled in their, their niche very well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's all I have to say about Churchill, man. Um, yeah. No, that's, yeah. I mean, what else is there to cover? He's he's very dead. <laughs> he is very dead. That, that unfortunate fact of reality. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. All right. Well, Aiden, hey, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I had a good time. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, all right. So fellow uh, historians and cigar lovers out there, keep on buffing and keep on puffing.